there's different facets of the Mallard Research Project, but we're dealing with the Mallard Telemetry Project here. So we've got um, a PhD student who's come all the way over from Canada to lead this part of the research. I guess the purpose of the project is to determine mallard productivity in New Zealand. Um, so we created five main research, research objectives. Um, one, to determine breeding propensity, so how many females actually do breed in a breeding season. Um, we found this year in the Auckland Waikato that was around 95%. Uh, second objective is to determine survival of um, females during the entire breeding season, so post-nesting, nesting, brood rearing, and, and then post-brood rearing. So we have a real good um, eight-month snapshot of the female survival. Right now we're looking at, in the Auckland Waikato, around, um, I think it was 78% of our females survived this year, regardless of whether or not they did nest or had broods. Third objective is uh, to determine nest and duckling survival. Um, so we did that obviously by monitoring the nest and then by tracking the females with the duckling. And our final objective is to um, put it all together and make population models to see how the population responds to the changes in these survival rates. So if female survival drops to 60%, how does that affect the overall population? Or if it's increased to 80% because of predator trap programs, who knows? Um, yeah, so that's the ultimate aims of this research. The core focus of this particular project um, lies within the Auckland Waikato region and the Southland region. Now the reason those regions were chosen was there's a perception, especially in Southland, that mallard numbers are still doing relatively well down there. Um, in fact, across many of the South Island regions, whilst the same probably can't be said for the Auckland Waikato, Eastern, um, and some of the other North Island regions. Certainly from the monitoring that we've done up here, there has been a, a decrease in our population, especially over the last six or seven years. So you're trying to isolate two um, spatially explicit populations and determine what's driving population change within those populations. Well, we're ready for incision. Data looks pretty good so far. I mean, our goal was to be able to track 100 birds in each site. We didn't do that, um, but we, we came close. We were surprised by how many birds actually left the study areas that we weren't able to find afterwards, especially in the Aqua Waikato, we lost nearly 20 females just up and left, which we have no idea where they went. Um, and then we had other birds where we just weren't allowed access on the land, which when you've already lost 20 of your birds, now five more is on a pond you're not allowed to access. It's, it can be frustrating. So I mean at the moment most regions have some form of monitoring of the mallard population, some obviously don't. Um, so it tells us normally about the adult population um, and that's about the extent of it, so the post-fledging population. It doesn't tell us anything about the productivity side and what's driving production and certainly internationally and also here um, that can actually be a key factor to determining overall population growth or decline. So if we don't understand what is driving production, we really can't get a very good handle on, um, on population change and how to maximise the population. So I've been really fortunate. Um, I've been able to obtain a lot of our equipment from Ducks Unlimited Canada. Um, they were a sponsor of my, my school masters and, and so they've also donated a lot of equipment um, probably in excess of $10,000 worth of equipment. Um, along with that, I've managed to um, secure external supervisors, so Dr. Courtney Amundsen from USGS in Alaska, who done her um, thesis work on mallard duckling survival in the prairie pothole region, as well as Dr. Todd Arnold, who's done a phenomenal amount of work on uh, breeding waterfowl ecology throughout the world. I'm also collaborating with a a scientist in Sweden who's looking at the defensin gene. So the defensin gene is, um, I guess, hypothesized to increase um, immune response among mallards. And so it's, it's throughout the global population, but we've been able to send in um, samples from our New Zealand birds, and we'll be able to relate um, the variation in this gene to um, mallard uh, habitat selection and reproductive survival and whatnot. So it's really interesting. The amount of times that birds will um, try to reproduce has certainly been a bit of an eye-opener. We've had up to 
four attempts of our birds or laying four lots of nests um, when nests have been unsuccessful. The length of the nesting season has been interesting. So yeah, there's, you know, we're learning all the time and there's certainly um, already some really interesting results that are coming out of it. Probably one of the main ones is um, the adult female survival rates during nesting. Um, we've lost across both study sites about 20% of our females. So that's a lot higher than I guess we might have anticipated. And when you add in up to 30% harvest, you know, you've really, that's 50% of your female population taken care of. And in the Auckland Waikato, through our banding data, we know that our juvenile female survival rates are depressed. They're very low, about 35% in any given year. So I guess this is elucidating why that might be the case. Um, so then that then, you know, throws up some interesting management implications. You know, if, if our females really are exhibiting such a lower survival rate than our, our males, you know, is there the potential to try and preferentially harvest drakes over females as we do with pheasants and some other game bird species? You know, does that make sense from a management perspective? So, yeah, once again, it's that management focus at the end that's the key. A couple of my biggest surprises was um, still finding males with the broods. Um, that was a big surprise for me. So doing brood observations and seeing males, which kind of confused us at first, especially when you get the more gray males, um, because you can't really tell if it's male or female. Um, but yeah, when you have the, the gray ducks in the area and they're what you're female, and so you're trying to figure out if they're together or what's going on. But um, we did see a lot of drakes hanging out with the broods afterwards, which was very unexpected. And the habitats that ducklings use was just, um, for instance, like for tuna, we expected um, ducks to come here and the females would be here. Uh, and, and once the ducklings hatched, they wouldn't come here until they got much older, almost 40 to 50 days older before they actually start coming to the lakes. Instead, they would hang out in drainage ditches or effluent ponds. Um, so that was quite surprising. So I was able to track birds or ducklings until um, sometimes 90 days of age before they would fly. Um, that's not to say they couldn't fly, they just didn't fly. Um, sometimes they would um, jump up and flutter a bit and go fly a bit forward, um, but they didn't actively just take off. Um, as you would expect, North America ducklings likely fly by 60 days of age, definitely. Um, so you don't really expect to see that time lag. Um, that, that could be factors of a lot of things. It could just be um, the lower temperatures here. You have to realize in North America during that time, it's the middle of summer. So a lot of those ducks are hatching when it's 25 to 30 degrees out. And, and that's the habitats that they're growing up in. Whereas here it's cold. It's wet, it's raining in September and October, so it's, um, it's a bit different. By the end of it, I mean, the, the actual field work component in total will be three years, including the first year, which was a smaller pilot study up here in the Auckland Waikato. Um, after that, obviously, Jen has the enviable task of sifting through about 5,000 records of nests and broods and um, actually crunching all the numbers and then writing up her PhD. So in regards to the final product if you will, it'll be in the form of a PhD plus some papers which will be published in the literature and that'll be available in about four years time when all of all is said and done. So, so far I've only managed to um, really analyze the Auckland Waikato data. Um, we're still sifting through the Southland data. Um, but in the Auckland Waikato region it does appear um, apparent survival, so apparent brood survival is um, around 35% and duckling survival is around 15%. That's very low for duckling survival. Um, North America, you usually see duckling survival double that. Um, it's not overly surprising. Um, we'll, we'll be out, you know, looking at our ducklings and out checking them out in the, in the little effluent pond or wherever they might be and we'll, we'll watch hawks swoop down and grab them and <laughs> and you go almost every second day and there's ten one day and seven and six and four <laughs> so it's you see them go real slow um that's quite sad so but um a little bit of good news if a 
If a duckling does manage to survive to 30 days of age, it has around a 91 to 92 percent chance of surviving the fledge and hopefully making it to the next breeding season or hunting season. Yeah, look, there certainly have been some challenges this year, and um, you know there will be again in the following year as well. Um, you know, whenever you've got two field crews operating in such different locations, making sure there's cohesion between the team, making sure that um, everyone's reading off the same song sheet, so to speak, is always going to be um, some difficulty there. So it's really about good communication, making sure that everyone can, you know, corresponds with one another. If there's any issues, to make sure we, we talk to, to each other about those, that's really the key. And the final aim of the project is to look at um, habitat requirements. So what do birds need to survive the nesting and broodering season? We've been collecting the habitat information and we'll be able to um, hopefully determine um, what habitats benefit nest survival and how we can implement that and change it for management um, programs.